All right. Hello, everybody. I guess I should move. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the post week two power rankings for the Star Gazer division. I am your host once again, the analyst Alakazams, back with the New York Melamars, and uh, we had a bunch of interesting games last week. Uh, everything kind of shifted based on those games. Now we're going to get right into it. All right, coming in at number 14, a new number 14, but, you know, going from 13 to 14, it's not too much of a change. The Philadelphia Flygons. Uh, as you can see by the team preview, the team did change slightly. No more Gengar, no more Gouging. Bex Caliber and Iron Moth are in. So, um, Flygons did uh, a few things wrong this week, I'd say. I think it was a good idea to bring the Toxic Spikes on Gengar because the hazard removal on Barry's side... You know, it wasn't great, uh, evidenced by the fact that the uh, Toxic Spikes managed to stay up the whole game. But uh, that was really, like, the main thing that actually went well. Because uh, a few things really um, hindered him. Uh, Araquanid just kind of uh, sat there and set up a sub, and he had to essentially exchange Pokemon both early game with Halucha and late game uh, with his Pokemon that actually survived the Hydreigon, you know, Devastation. They basically had to exchange their lives to get rid of the Araquanid sub, which was uh, really unfortunate. The coverage, the bug water coverage, proved really problematic for him. He didn't have a good uh, water switch in that also wanted to take a bug move. And then obviously, you know, the big uh, elephant in the room, I suppose, is that he kind of just sits around with an Earthquake Slowking that does no damage to Golden Go, lets it get up screens, lets it memento. He basically just lets it do exactly what it wants to do, what it's designed to do. And if you let a Pokemon sit there for three turns and just do exactly what it wants to do, it's going to get the opponent into a winning position. And that's exactly what it did for Mary, who uh, gets their Hydreigon in. Quick's nasty plot. It's already too late. He doesn't, because he doesn't go um, uh, Rotom Bow fast enough to get the uh, Scarf off in any way. So he switches Rotom Bow, but it's already too late because it clicks Dark Pulse the turn after, and then it's locked into uh dark pulse but it's plus two special attack plus one speed behind screens now and he's kind of uh co-signed his own demise and he sacks a bunch of pokemon before realizing Ursula Luna blood moon can even actually live the dark pulse so he didn't even need to sack those pokemon because he could have probably blood mooned into vacuum wave or vacuum wave twice if he was specs or something so uh, poor play around that for sure he never brought gouging because it's gone now he didn't in the two weeks he had it he didn't bring it which uh I guess shows how uncomfortable he was he was with it, which is why he dropped it. But overall, it, it's not a strong start from Philly. They're zero and two minus ten. Uh, what do you have to say about uh, Philly, Melmars? I think that the both of those matchups were unfortunately quite bad. Just and there was some bad luck in the first game. The second game, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened because I was on the call for this game and I knew the sets and I thought he was going to trick the Choice Scarf and I thought it was going to end the game the way that it did. But I think Gengar was still alive with Dazzling Gleam. So in retrospect, if he had taken a few more moments to not... Once the High Dragon is setting up behind the screens, I'm assuming that there was a panic of, you know, what can I do with this? But if we had maybe waited a couple more turns, like you said, use the Blood Moon for what it's supposed to be, which is just to do damage, and even if you trade one for one there, because without the Scarf, uh, I don't think that Hydreigon has agility. Maybe it does, but it, he couldn't no. have ever outsped Gengar, yeah, which I Gengar think was still alive. Gleam. Yeah, it was. And yeah, and it had, yeah, and it had Dazzling Gleam, so in retrospect, he should have just burned the turns and then killed it, but um, when you're in the moment, I think he panicked a little bit in the soon as he brought the Mo in, I think on the call when this video comes out, I say, I hope he doesn't trick the Choice Scarf here because that's going to be the end of the game. And Mary was smart enough to see. You see Rotom come out there, you figure it's going to be, because like he can't damage you, so it has to be Scarf, so you click the attack. Um, I don't before know... that point, I thought he was actually playing relatively well outside of the, the, the Slow King thing. As you said, you let it set up. But I think he needed to know that when he saw the High Dragon was nasty, he thought, okay, yeah, this is dangerous, but it's not fast. Yeah, so I, mean, I do have counterplay to it. He did He did lose Halucha very early as well to Araquanid, Sub-Araquanid. He really didn't have a yeah. great switch into Sub-Araquanid. It was a crit, the yeah. liquidation, to be fair. 
But it still would have yeah. done probably like 70 or 80 percent, which I don't know if you want your whole lucha to take that. And then she just switches yeah. out to um, Diancy, I believe, was in the game. So it, it, it's just an interesting situation. Uh, I, I will say I don't know if this game is going to get uploaded for reasons we won't I won't specify. Oh, uh, uh, I remember now. Yeah, okay. I, I say this game might not get uploaded, but um, it, it, I, I do think he kind of crafted his own demise here uh, in the middle of the game. All right. All right. Yeah, based based on the record, this is where we... I think the team is better now just because Baxcalibur is a lot easier yeah, to use. Yeah, Baxsloking. And so, was, I think Iron I think... Moth is severely underrated in draft. I think it's very good. Yep. So we'll see what happens. All right. And moving on to the team at 13, moving up a spot through uh, kind of some merit. They only lost a, a 2-0 to the Pittsburgh Scissors. So uh, that's not too bad. Uh, there there were some some positives here, in my opinion, from the Clombrook Kyogres. Uh, Gardakuno, I thought, had a pretty good set. I think it was Specs based on the freezing glare damage on the Comfey. At the very least, Pittsburgh did not expect Phoenix Glare to do that much because he switched directly into it and took 70%. Uh, but not predicting that he'd go as Dark type after seeing that and him probably thinking your specs based on that damage, that's pretty bad. Um, uh, he goes Mian Xiao on the uh, Dark Rai hard, takes like 60%, and then just dies the turn after. So he sacks Mian Xiao. Mian Xiao does literally nothing this game. He has Zen Headbutt on King Gambit. I don't know why... I looked over Pittsburgh's team, so and the thing's weak to it, like Petrarant, uh, Petrarant's also weak to Dark, uh, and having that was actually pretty bad, because it ended up Dark Rai got a free switch in, because he clicked Zen Headbutt. Uh, he did use El Creamy very well. Uh, El Creamy, I think if it doesn't get crit on that turn, depending on the set, has a decent chance to sweep uh, Pittsburgh. So, uh, obviously Ivy Cutchell has a high crit chance, so it's not like crazy that he got crit. But if you didn't get crit there, I do kind of like Klombrook's chances of like whittling a few things there and having a decent shot at winning the game. Um, Raging Bolt was used much better this game. It you know it switched out at one point, so it can come back later. It was the late game Pokemon that it needed to be. It almost won the game at the end. I think maybe if you look like Thunderbolt into Thunderclap, and then uh, I believe the Flamigo, from what I heard, did have upper hand, so he'd have to like predict that and go for Thunderbolt instead of Thunderclap. Uh, but uh, it, it would be a prediction game at that point. But he did use Raging Bolt better. It was available at the end. Um, he got outplayed at one point with Raging Bolt against Water Pond. He clicked Thunderclap when he already knew that the Water Pond had Encore. And the Water Pond clicked Encore. So then he was forced to switch and sack his Gardakuno. So he lost the Pokemon because of that outplay. But overall, you know, 2-0, not too bad. Uh, Heart Flame didn't really do much. Kind of got stonewalled by um, Rotom Heat. It, it did feel like Pittsburgh was always in control, like Pittsburgh was always going to win this game. But it, 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 he at least made it interesting. So remind me, what was the set on the Raging Bolt? Was it Booster Energy again? Yeah, it, it was Booster Energy, mind. but he at least switched it out. It, it was it was Thunderbolt, okay. Calm Mind, Booster Energy, uh, Thunderclap, and I had uh, Draco. Draco was the fourth move. I think what I've seen from Klonbrook so far is I think he's spamming setup too much. Um, instead of playing for a long, just, just some of these sets. So like, I think the division that he's playing in, uh, spamming setup in general with newer players, I think works better, but I think some of these mods, like I've used Gambit in draft before. I think you even like some choice band set sometimes, like some other things you could do it. So you don't just have to bring it out at the end of the game, because when you're playing against some of these more experienced players, Yes, the booster energy uh, Raging Bolt set is good, but I yeah. just I feel like you can get more mileage out of it if you're expecting to play a long game against the skill player with the spec set or AV or, I don't know, boots, depending on the matchup. Just something where it gets it, more value cause, cause rather than one turn. He had set up Bolt, he had set up Heart Flame, and he had set up Alcremy, so half his team was set yeah. up. Yeah, I feel like he's spamming it too much. Like, if you just... Because, I mean, Al Creamy's not going to be any other set for the most part, so that's yeah. fine. But Hearth Flame, like, if you know that there's uh, a Rotom on the other side, the the Heat Rotom, there's definitely coverage in the Ogre Pond kit that could damage that over time. It gets Rock Tomb. Yeah. 
But if you're just running the standard SD Trailblaze set, you just don't have enough attacks to really damage it. So yeah. I think Klonbrook uh, needs to open up his kit a little bit more on some of these mods, especially because he doesn't have the most, like, for instance, specs on the Articuno was good, that it wasn't just the stored power set. I just think if you bring three setup sweepers to games in the Stargazer division, I, you're not going to end up with a really great record because it's just too, especially when it's the when the basic sets. Yeah, I, I, I I'm assuming it was specs. Variety. I don't know for sure, but it did a lot to Comfe and Pittsburgh didn't expect it at all to do that much. So I have yeah. to assume it was specs. So I like this this placing for Klon. I just think because his, he doesn't have a lot of team synergy, like we talked about in the yeah, the team um, isn't very good. I think I think a few yeah. changes are in order. I think Electros plus like the, like the triple electric, two of them non Terra, like pretty similar in what they do. I, I think that's not necessary. Yeah, um, and then if it, in in my opinion, Klonberg, if we're gonna spam this much setup. Bring some Rotom screens or something to support it so that, like, if that's the strategy we're going to use, we need more support. So, because Ogre Pond's a great setup mon and Gambit's a great setup mon, but, like, they need they they need some support because the other team is going to assume that's the set until they see it's something else. So, yep. that's how I'm feeling about uh, Klonbrook right now. All right, and moving on to the next team. At number 12, we have a pretty big drop in the New Jersey Dracos, who only lost uh, 0-1. And uh, I think actually played pretty well. I think they got most turns right from what I remember. I think they came in with a pretty good game plan with Colossal, with the um, with the spikes. He had spikes, Colossal, and the opponent had no way of really getting rid of the spikes, so the spikes stayed up the whole game. He led Colossal. He did let it die early, which I think wasn't great. He didn't like necessarily need to let it die there. Although maybe he did because... Um, the reason he's dropped this low, even though he, I think he actually played technically, like, most turns correctly, like, he got pretty unlucky with a, a gunk miss. I think it was a very huge gunk miss because it kind of cost him his Crocodile, who I think was one of the key uh, Pokemon this match, and it really put him on the back foot. But I, I, I think in that is my main point here. If anything goes wrong with this team, it completely collapses, and I think... Uh, I've turned on this team. I, I think uh, we, we said at the beginning this could end up being a pretty bad team. I, I think I've fully turned to this being a bad team. It doesn't have the defensive backbone to stay in this division. It, it gets broken down too easily. And even if you play, like, I think Dracos has played, like, not bad at all. And he's 0-2 because of it. Like, like, he just doesn't have the, the room for any mistakes, even if they're not his own mistakes, like a gunk miss is just so devastating for him. There's nothing he can do. And also Deoxys speed. This was a choice. Like I know the Metagross in this game was assault vest, but this was a choice specs. So that kind of like, you know, mitigates it. This was a choice specs, uh, Deoxys speed. If I remember correctly, shadow ball did like 40% to Metagross and then it died to knock off. It was pathetic. Deoxys speed has very much over the past two seasons, shown me that it, he is not him if you're not nasty plot he is not him in my opinion he is uh he, he offensively i mean maybe the sp i think the spikes and like light street stuff that's good obviously and i think maybe that's what you should use it as mostly but for how many points it is it has like it's offensive i i don't know i just haven't seen it so far in pbo to really be a, a super great offensive threat uh unless you're bringing like nasty plot life orb then maybe you can do some stuff like, I, I know Orange used it, and it sometimes did stuff last season. Uh, I don't really have anything to say about negatively about how he played. So, uh, I, I don't really know. Like, maybe some stuff with Primarina. Like, Primarina came out on Metagross, on a th and Metagross got the Thunder Punch because it wasn't Sneasler that came out to clean it up at 20%. That might have been bad. Um, uh, I, I, I just think maybe the team needs a little bit of a re reboot. Yeah, I think it, it was one of the first things I mentioned when we talk, talked about this team is I had a team, it wasn't a terrain team, but a kind of a team like this in the second season I was in this league. And like, I wasn't prepping really with the team, but I found that when you just bring all gas, like all offense, and people know you're bringing all offense, it's just really easy to plan for it. And then there are some trap mons here that you need to learn how to use. So Dio Speed, you mentioned it. It really only has two sets that I think are really good. Life Orb Nasty Plot is really good, but you have to know when to bring it out. If you give it the benefits of Dio Speed, right, is you can run max HP and still outspeed everything. So you have to, uh, you're going to lose to most Scarfers 
but you just bring that out at the right time, get the nasty plot up, and at the, if you bring it out at the right time, you win. Other than that, it just needs to be light screen and uh, hazards, or just screens and or hazards. It just doesn't have enough offense without the time to boost. It's only got 95 special attack. Like, it's not strong. And then the Sneasler, I think the setup with, the, with this whole team is built around, which we talked about at the beginning of the season. I just don't think it's that good. Like, the Unburdens, it is good, and it's really good on ladder, so is Palucha. But when you know it's coming, there's just so many ways to plan for it. Anything with will o -Wisp that can take one hit, and then it just doesn't win. So I think the big problem for Dracos is he has a, a lot of really good late-game stuff, but he has very little early and mid-game stuff to set it up. And like you said, there's no switch-ins, and in draft, I feel like you need two or three offensively viable switch-ins. So he has Colossal, but it has no offensive capabilities really at all. And he has Earthworm, who again has very little to no offensive capabilities. So his switch-ins generate no momentum, they have no switch moves, and they can do no damage. So they're just dead turns. So I think, well, the guys look really good. And again, we said this on ladder when people didn't know it was coming would be crazy. But I, this type of team, I, I almost feel in some way this is like a baby version of the team I have, which is the rain team, where when you have a really defined strategy, good people will figure out a way to at least slow you down. And then if you, if you can't recover from it, you just lose, as we've seen the first two weeks with Dracos. So I don't know that it's the player. I just think this team style is not conducive to high-level draft play. Yeah, I, I think Draco is overall is playing uh, pretty good. I, I I think he's playing uh, not bad at all. It's just the the team I think is for sure letting him down. All right, and then so we're gonna move on to the team that I have at number eleven, the Sunnyside Scream Tales, and I think this game. Uh, it, it's really simple, honestly, how it went. So they lost 0-2 to the Vancouver Valiants, and uh, they played better. And not the majority, just because the game was so short, but for the beginning. The beginning of the game, the first 10 or so turns, they played better than the Valiants. You know, uh, they led Miascarada. They instantly got a kill, which is huge. You know, the Glamora down, no hazards. That's big. Because your hazard control is limited. You do have Altaria, which I assume, you know, had defog, but still. Uh, he, uh, she really, uh, and it's something that Mug does sometimes, was just categorized by a very passive play. Like, incredibly passive, switching, wishing with Screamtail, just switching around. Just, uh, you know, thinking if your Pokemon are as much health as possible, then you're going to win. Uh very scared of a scald burn from Vaporeon on Ting Lu when there was no ground resist on the opponent's side and Ting Lu could have gotten a kill like uh, at any point. So, you know, you're winning the first few turns. Glamora's dying, Vaporeon's, you know, not taking the hits well from Ting Lu, but you're, you're, you're just switching around doing uh, nothing for a while, really. You're getting screens up that do nothing. The screens are for no real reason. And then eventually, you know, Vaporeon dies, Annihilate waltzes in, and, you know, it, it clicks two buttons, bulk up into taunt, and, and the game ends. It, it's just, you know, the, the passivity is just a massive issue from Mug. The, the, the passive way that they, uh, she plays the game uh, here, it, it just proved to be a, a bit problematic. Annihilate, you know, probably going for the two Dracos after to just give it the Rage Fist boost. It wasn't very smart. Maybe if, uh, while it was setting up the bulk ups... Before it was plus three, she went hard in Meowth or even if you go hard Jolteon, Terra Ghost, and then um, Shadow Ball for about like 50%, and then go Meowth after, you know, you just lose Jolteon, you probably win the game from there too, because Jolteon is kind of expendable. Uh, it, it's just... And then obviously, uh, she makes a wrong play and switches Meowth hard in when they choose to click Rage Fist and dies in one turn. And, and, and that's bad, obviously. That's unfortunate. But it, it, I think really, re more so than that one turn, I kind of want to highlight how, uh, like, not taking advantage of the really great position she put herself in early on was kind of also part of her undoing is kind of what I want to focus on and how she, you know, was really scared uh, to click Earthquake with Ting Lu and how she was really passive with, like, you know, wishing around to Pokemon that were already at, like, 80-plus percent health, getting light screens and reflect up, 
uh, on Pokemon that didn't really set up or use them for anything. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's really what I want to emphasize. Yeah, I think when I was watching this game, in retrospect, when it's mentioned, in theory, I understand, you know, wanting to switch out to not take the 30% chance. But I know that she had played this game through a lot, and she was at a, a structural disadvantage, a massive disadvantage. Yeah, like I, yeah obviously, this game was, game. Yeah. Well, as we saw, one wrong turn with Annihilate, but Annihilate destroys this team. So, uh, yeah, uh, so... It, yeah, Valiance probably wins this game 90 times out of 100. So what I was thinking was, okay, if you're in a position where, you know, if you click Earthquake again and you kill the Vaporeon, you're probably going to win. So you have a 70% chance of winning a game. You should only have a 10% chance to win. So while I respect the long play, um, the, the big issue I thought with all the switching around was they let Trez get back its health. And yeah, because Vaporeon was, was clicking Wish also. Yes, and there was multiple opportunities, especially when the screens were up, where to actually go to Jolteon, which was the setup sweeper. And it would have killed Treads. We found out later it was Scarf, I think. It would have died to a, to a Shadow Ball at 30%. And I don't think she probably could have lost from that. I mean, you can always lose, obviously. We saw that. But it would have been very difficult to lose from that position. So you mentioned the passive play. And if you're like the big favorite, like if Valiance played that way, which he kind of did. I understand that because you're supposed to win the game. The more turns the game goes, the more the game is in your favor. But Mug took a really, you know, it was a chance to click the uh, triple axle at the beginning, but you, she put the only set in and the only lead that could put her in the position to win, which is smart. That's good. Uh, but as you mentioned, I think when you're the underdog, I think we said this last week or maybe in the Pickums video, you need to do more things. Like, you need to go outside the box. So I think, yes, just clicking Earthquake over and over again. I would have clicked EQ until Ting Lu died. Like, I would have just kept clicking it over and over again and say, stop this. Because, as you mentioned, there was no ground resist. So um, I think we've got to give her some points because she the lead was the only way to take the lead in the game. But then I don't think she played to her outs to win because I, me personally in that matchup, if I have a 70% chance, because Skull is 30% chance to burn, right? If I have a 70% chance to essentially put myself in an almost, you know, a commanding position, I'm going yeah. to do that. Because I, I think the only um, thing he could do is exactly what he did after that if the burn doesn't happen, which is go annihilate and click bulk up. Which, by the way, if I was her, I would click Earthquake again on the uh, yeah. on, on the plus one annihilate. And I it, would pro it would yeah, probably do like because it, it was like a spadef and it would probably do like 45 percent at plus one defense uh, maybe yeah, and the thing is because i i know we had seen this in a mock that we played uh, if it was spadef annihilate the, the meows card comes in and does 80 damage no matter what like 80 plus damage so you just needed really any chip at all and um it the bulk up wasn't going to be an issue for you assuming you did any damage so uh yeah, you get points for the early game play, but uh, sometimes it, I, I think if you play to win, it's better than playing not to lose in general, in my opinion. So you got to dock some points for that one. Yeah. All right. Moving on to number 10. Someone who moved up a few spots despite a loss. Oh, the Charleston Chestnuts lost to the Durants uh, 0-2 this week. In a, in a fairly close match, I think. I think this match was uh, decently played on both sides. You know, pr a pretty good game. Uh, Durant did have initiative very early on. He was U-turning with Greninja and bolting with Lantern. And it led to a turn where he could get uh, rocks up. And uh, Charleston really had no way of getting rid of them. So that was really good for Durant. Uh, he was kind of on the back foot early because his, uh, his gameplay was a little too uh, reactive. He was kind of just reacting because the initiative was so strong from Durant's in the early game, he was just reacting to whatever, like he was having to switch in and then, uh, he, he, he and then he would have to like respond in turn to what, uh, Durant's was doing. He played a uh, Dusk, Lycanroc Dusk a little too early in my opinion. And he kind of just lets it die to a great Tusk that was, uh, pretty, pretty clearly signaling that, I mean, not, you obviously can't tell, but you know, but, uh, it comes out, it's, it's somewhat signaling that it's going to be um, a scarfer. He's going to have a scarfer out there. Uh, 
I think one of the bigger downfalls of Charleston this game was the fact that uh, Bundle was booster, because Bundle was really good in this game at putting on pressure, but it couldn't do any pressure in the early or mid game until the game was like not lost, but pretty close to lost uh, because it's booster speed. So he doesn't want to lose the speed boost. So he was scared to bring it out. I, I, I think like if, if it was just scarf bundle, that could have been fine. Like I know the idea of trying to switch your move is good, but uh, it, it's one of the reasons like I don't love a uh, booster a lot. Like when I had raging bolt last season, I've rarely ran booster. I, I think it severely limits, you know, what your Pokemon is able to do. Unless you're, like, a, a sweeping set, like a setup sweeping set, I, I personally don't love it a lot of the time. Um, I really don't think he made too many mistakes, though. Like, I know I just listed off a few, but I, 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 he switched, like, with Dragology around pretty good. He used Miss Magius uh, to a decent effect. You know, his Bronzong 1v1 to the Reverbroom, effectively, which was cool. Um... I think he clicked Will-O-Wisp twice with Weez and Galar, and he lost a lot of momentum because of that, which was, uh, you know, unfortunate. But I, I do think this was a strong showing of this new team. And I, I think if the bundle was, you know, Scarf, and he was, like, flip-turning and stuff, although obviously Rocks got up and he had no way of removing them, which was unfortunate. But uh, I, I think those are really the key takeaways here. I think Dragology was used pretty good. I think he uh, is using Dragology pretty well uh, this season, from what I've seen. So th that's kind of my takeaway. Yeah, I think like what you mentioned, I don't like booster on bundle because it can't set up. So I don't I think you'd always want to bring because it's such a nuke, right? I feel like I'd always be running boots, specs or scarf, depending on the week. Like those would be the only three items I would ever run on this thing. Just because uh, I feel like because it has no boosting capability, you want to get this in as many times as possible. And the fact it has flip turn means this is just like better Keldeo. So, but at least Keldeo has set up. But like you, it just it just seems like it would have been better in this game. But yeah, I, th I think Don played well. I think there was a turn at the end where you mentioned the will o -Wisp. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I thought he should have switched when he didn't and he would have won in that case. Uh, but that was a really hard play to make. But I remember watching the game and thinking, uh, he's probably going to go Greninja here. He should switch to X or he should strange steam here. It was something like that. Um, but outside of that, uh, the only downside we got to say for Don is even though Durant is higher ranked, I thought Don team wise had the advantage in this game. Um, so while he was playing a higher ranked team, I think he probably should have won this game. Uh, and maybe it was the bundle set that let him down if he just he just needed a few more turns. Because I think if bundle was Scarf, I don't remember. I think it just would have been better and it might have just won. At, the, so, at, at, uh, that particular, at that, I mean, obviously, it's hard to, like, say it when it's uh, the game that you see. But in that exact game, yeah, if it, if it was Scarf, it would have won. Because it, the Greninja, the main thing that, you know, lost in the game at the very end was the Greninja was Scarf, which... Uh, Durant's didn't actually like it, re reveal that in any capacity until close to the end game that it was. Yeah, a I, I I remember watching because I I wasn't a hundred percent fully watching on my first watch too. I did I thought Don won. I did not realize that the Greninja was yeah. scarred from just passively watching the game. Dur Durant's so I think didn't Don fully, said he yeah. knew. But, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it, yeah. I think this is a good. I think this is a good place for Don. I think. Um, I'm not sure Don is fully locked in. The way he the way he was the last couple of seasons, but uh, I feel like if he gets on track with this team, it has it has a good amount of potential. I like it more now that I've seen it the last couple of weeks. Like in theory, crafting, I think it's pretty good. All right, and with that, we'll move on to number nine. I've got the uh, the first team that won last week. I think I've got here, or the first team I'm showing that actually won a game last week. I mean. Uh, the Vancouver Valiants I've got at number nine. Uh, they beat the Sunnyside Screen Tails, uh, but I don't think it, they played particularly well. And taking into account Week One, I don't think they've played particularly well so far this season. Um, they lost Glamora immediately. Two games in a row, they've lost their first Pokemon in the first uh, turn. Uh, they played around Ting Lu pretty poorly. Uh, he didn't have like a great option, obviously, but that's mainly because his Glamora, which was Air Balloon, died immediately. Um, and they were kind of just losing the, the the game. If Mug wasn't playing so passively, they probably do lose the game. 
until Annihilate came in. And then obviously the Annihilate set, it was a good Annihilate set. And uh, he played it pretty decently. And uh, he got the bulk ups he needed off. And then he clicked Rage Fist when he needed to. And he killed four Pokemon. And then he uh, kind of lost two differential because he let Annihilate get burned when it really didn't need to because he could have just taunted again and then Rage Fist and then he kills the last two easily. So, uh, kind of just the mediocre play, bad play at the beginning, bad play at the end, and then, like, fine play at the middle to get the, uh, the sweep with Annihilate, a Pokemon that had a pretty good matchup this game. So I'm not, you know, overtly impressed with the win, I guess is what I want to say. Uh, I, uh, I, I just think, uh, he did what, uh, he needed to do. He did what he should have done. You know what I mean? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. I think after seeing Valiant a couple weeks, like I, I agree with what you said is that I don't think that he's had any outstanding sets or game plans. And my concern with the team is my original things were, I didn't think I've never seen Glamora, Volcarona and rarely, um, Grimmsnarl work out. And I have still yet to see Glamora, Grimmsnarl or Volcarona work out in any of these games. Some of them, I don't think it came in, but just like the Glamora so far, is about doing what it usually does, which is just die, and th like then the hazards get removed. So I'd like to see him come up with some d different sets or different ways to implement, say, Glamora or Volcarona or um, Grimmsnarl, because these are big parts of the team, the way in paper it's supposed to work. But all the things I thought probably wouldn't work about it have already not worked. So I don't know if that means that we need to just play better or we need to maybe try something else out, see what's out there in free agency, just because we have such good pieces in Kiram and Annihilate that are carrying the team right now, but they're doing exactly what everybody thinks they're going to do. And eventually he's going to play a team that has the tools to deal with Annihilate and Kiram better than the last two teams have. Uh, and then some of these other guys are going to have to do something. And I'm not, I'm not sure what they, I know what they do. I know what they're supposed to do. But we've yet to see it work any better than I originally feared that it would not work, if that makes yeah. sense. He had really good match, And he lost one of these games badly, by the way. And he had really good matchups the last two weeks. So it's... Um, I, 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 he won. That's why he's up there here, obviously. But I, I'm not fully convinced we're anywhere yet. You know what I mean? I'm not fully convinced yeah. we're, we're in a playoff kind of zone at the moment. Yeah, this is the Volcarona week, I think, from what I remember about the matchup. So if Volcarona can't do anything in this game, it might be time to look elsewhere. All right. And with that, we'll move on to the game or the team at number eight. And we've got the New York Malamars yourself. So this was a a, a loss this week to the uh, Moochin Embors. And I think really this game just kind of exemplified the the downfalls the downtrodden nature that can kind of come with uh with weather uh sunny day twice uh two disastrous turns for sunny day to come out kind of a uh, cost uh arcaladon uh from it, it, very cool sets obviously on the roaring moon because it benefits moon directly and on the skarm because you know electroshot something you want to hit skarm with and all of a sudden, you know, it's a free switch to Mamo. Uh, not knowing the Zangus was Terra Ground directly led to the death of two Pokemon, which obviously isn't great, including the Rain Setter, which means, you know, Rain was going to go away uh, in limited turns. Uh, Iron Crown, you know, uh, it ended up being a, a big momentum sink because it was locked in. Zapdos got to come in twice on resisted moves, which is unfortunate. Uh, you know, this I just think the sets from Embors were really good. You know the the Focus Sash Mamo, the Sunny the the Sunny Day uh Skarm. It really let uh you know them get rid of Arcalodon early, who I thought Arcalodon had a pretty decent matchup. It kind of you know exchanged with any one Mon, which it and it did do with Mamo Swine, but uh in in a way that was like more in Embors control than Malamar's. Uh. It, the end of the game, it, it, there's really nothing worth talking about because it was kind of over already. But, like, you know, setting up with Forges, it didn't really, like, mean anything. It didn't do anything. 
uh, I think this game really just kind of shows Embor's uh, prep savviness and also kind of how uh, weather can lead to some pitfalls sometimes. What, 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 do you, what do you think about the game you played? When I played the game, it felt worse than when I went back and watched it. So I think when you're we I was playing kind of like this is a hyper offense team for the most part. And there's one particular turn where Skarmory ended up at 99 health and I went to our child on and he sunny dayed on me. If I went to Floatzel in the rain, I would have killed anything that switched in in one hit. And in retrospect, me predicting fast sunny day Skarmory, it's just like not something I think anybody would have thought was going to be the set. So I understand why I went Arch on there. But if I had played the game the way it's supposed, like the hyper offense, the way it's supposed to be played, just gone for kills, I probably, I, I don't know that I would have won from that position because I wouldn't have ass assumed focus Sash Mamoswine. So he probably still would have killed the also from there but that's the one term when i went back and looked at it is that i was too passive and didn't play the style the way it's supposed to be played but other than that um i liked the zangu set from uh Ambors. i thought that was a good set yeah, it was cool. i should have known that it was tear ground i just assume if it i'm not saying if i had known that i would have just clicked terror blast off rip um but I was glad I, I didn't get swept by it because I knew to attack the Zangoose no matter what happened. So I broke the sub. I, I didn't, to be fair, I didn't know it had belly jump. I'm not going to front like I knew that was a move that Zangoose had. So I, I thought that uh, a lot of the sets worked. I think if I had just led Gastrodon with hazards, like I considered a couple of times, I think the whole game plan for Embors, I don't know how, if it works as well. So I think this was a game that was... His prep was very good for predicting particularly what I brought, which was no hazards and um, uh, just mainly the, the range strategy. And then also just having the iron head on uh, Skarmory, I think it mattered because I think Floor just from that position, if Skarmory only had body press, actually could have came back and won the game from what I remember. Because I remember thinking when we were out there, I'm like, well, the only way I can win is if I set up and he has no move to hit this, and then it'll just set up and kind of whittle everything down over time. So, you know, he brought everything that he needed to bring, and I do think this shows the limitations of uh, a particular strategy that the team doesn't have to play but is geared towards functioning optimally. It's pretty easy to plan around it. Uh, assuming you have the pieces to do it. And for Embor, Zapdos and Skarmory were very useful in this game. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good showing by Embor's. Um, I think this is about the right place for the rain team. Yeah, and with that, we'll move on to the team at number seven. We're in the top half now. All right, we've got the Norwalk Neuverns, who are 2-0. Uh, and oh. They have uh, won both their games. But uh, not necessarily an impressive two and zero. I believe they are two and zero plus two, so they've won both of their games one zero. Um, they had a really really good matchup this week, in my opinion. Uh, they got a little lucky with a uh, with a with a gunk miss from Crocodile, which led to its death. But I do think they played Hydrapple well early. You know, they got Colossal dead. Uh, they had like the numbers advantage early. The the AV Metagross, I think really where Neuwalk is uh excelling is the Metagross sets. I think Metagross is really, you know, doing its job very, very well so far, these two games. Uh obviously, you know, Draco's recognized there was no hazard control this week and acted accordingly, it got spikes up, which were a huge huge pain for uh Norwalk. And then I, I think Norwalk played kind of poorly around Sneasler at the end game which uh, led to a few deaths that were kind of unnecessary and made the game differential closer than it needed to be. This probably could have been a 3-0 or even maybe a 4-0 if um, Sneasler was pl played around a little bit better. You know, maybe just uh, sack one thing instead of going hard clawed and then go hard clawed and you literally wall it hard and you can recover and then you can earthquake and you kind of just win. Um, but, you know, overall, they've won. They, they're winning. Uh, the, the team I still think is, you know, interesting. I don't think it's bad. I think it, it's fat. It's really fat and it has like three Pokemon that can either set up or, you know, just hit hard, uh, initially, uh, the, the last four, I don't believe have come and I have a hard time seeing them coming 
at this point, except hit my, I, I think, uh, Volbeat holds a uh, very high value, uh, Mac in certain matchups and hit on top might come just for rapid spin. Uh, but over, overall, uh, so far Norwalk's been decent, you know, uh, that's what, how I'm feeling about it. This is very much like the Valiance team in that I don't think that, uh, Neuverns has played that well. Like, I don't, I think if he played well in that Crook game, it should have been a 6-0, maybe a 5-0, just based on the matchup from what we were looking at. So the fact Crook was in that game at all kind of shows um, just not aggressive play. Like, I think that the point of this team with the Skeledurge and the Hydrapple is that, yeah, they're Stolmons, but they're supposed to gain you advantage based on what they do, because Hydrapple's really an offensive regenerator Pokemon. This is not Toxapex. Like, it's supposed to do things. Um, they did do things yeah, this think game, people... which was nice. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, people are getting surprised by Metagross a little bit. I think Metagross in this gen got big buffs, and it's actually really good. Uh, I, it's something I'd like to use. I think it with knockoff and it with all the sets it can run, it has probably like 10 different real items and all kinds of sets. So I think people are getting taken aback by that a little bit. I, I and think Metagross also... is kill leader or close to kill leader right now. Yeah, it's definitely people like this thing is, has a lot of tools and it with knockoff, heavy slam and psychic fangs, like it got huge buffs. I think it's actually quite good. Yeah. Uh, I, I remind me, have we seen Iron Valiant do anything yet? Not much. Uh, it, it had expanding force, which was a cool idea. I didn't. Like, it got a kill. It got like two, one or two kills this game, it, which is fine. You know, it doesn't need to sweep every week. It can kind of just clean stuff if it needs to. Yeah, I'd like to see. Uh, that's one of the things I'd like to see going forward against other teams. So this week, there's a big litmus test for this team against Agrons, and Noivern's been in the the chat talking up a storm. So we're gonna see what happens, but. Valiance is not a brain dead Pokemon. Like you really have to figure out the right set for the week. You have to bring it in at the right time. You have to figure out how it synergizes with it. It's a, it's a fill in the gaps guy, right? For the most part, I think that's the best way to use it. So we're going to see over the course of the season, if Neuverns can figure out how to win with Valiant plus stall, which I don't think is some standard build that is, you can just look up on Google. So he's doing he's doing well so far, but the question is how much of that is just happenstance and how much of that has actually been him. So I th think this is the week where we're going to find out. All right, and with that, we'll move on to the team at number six. We've got the Pittsburgh Scizors, who I think has been playing actually quite well. I have been uh, very uh, impressed by the Pittsburgh Scizors, by their play, by their prep. Um, I, you know, I think Darkrai being scarfed this game, it was huge. It really, really helped because, you know, at the plus three, um, heart flame, it outsped that, it outsped the Bien Chao if that was also scarfed, which I have to assume it was if Pombrook was willing to stay in on the Darkrai. Um, I think, uh, you know, switching, uh, Comfe in on Gardakuno turn one was bad obviously because he didn't expect it to do that much he didn't expect specs at all but he recovered quite nicely with the dark rise switch in which allowed it to uh you know blank the move obviously and, and he gained initiative right back he's uh rotom h set was good it neutralized heart flame successfully uh the, the one gripe obviously being he didn't know how a rumor veil worked uh, and he encored the Alcremi and let it set up. And if he didn't crit the Alcremi, he probably loses. It, it's close. I, I don't know exactly if he loses. It depends on if he's recover Alcremi and like how much training kiss help got back. But um, uh, th that's bad, obviously. But you know, I, I I think Pittsburgh's playing pretty well. I think he's bringing you know correct sets. Flamigo was pretty good in this uh, last game. Petrant uh, didn't really do much. I, I do wish Petrant was doing more. It hasn't been doing so much too much these past few games. It's kind of just dying. It seems to be a sack of, a sack a lot of the time, which I I don't think is uh, what it needs to be. But um, I, I am overall impressed. I I I think uh his play has been you know he sees a vision for what the game should be, and so far two games in a row he's executed that. Uh, last game it was a come face sweep that's how he thought he needed to win the game in a pretty bad matchup and he got it and this week uh, Scarf Darkrai he thought you know could uh, really kind of just pick Pokemon and uh, clean up and it did 
So, uh, and, you know, he thought, you know, Rotom Heat, that's a good answer to Heart Flame, and it was. And, uh, and I know he had Upper Hand Flamigo, which is a pretty cool bring for, like, a Thunderclap, Raging Bolt. So I think his sets, you know, they're pretty good. Um, uh, and, you know, he, he knew he was going to bring setup. The the opponent was going to bring setup, as we talked about how Clombrook likes setup. And he brought Encore, even though it doesn't work on Upper Hand, it does work on, like, Raging Bolt, which he used effectively, and it does work on King Gambit. So, uh, Everything I've seen, I think Pittsburgh's playing well so far this season. Yeah, I like a lot of what he's been doing. I think the only drawbacks in the long run are of this team, eventually the fact that it's Doug Trio is going to come back to bite Pittsburgh. Like, it has to at some point that that's the ground. And then remind me, has uh, Uxie done anything? No. Has it come to the uh, Has I, it I come? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it's come. I, don't think it, I might have come week okay. one just because only two Pokemon hit the field week one, so I don't remember exactly what he brought. But I, I don't think it's come. I think I don't think I like Blastoise the way is coming. Uh, it might have come. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't think Blastoise is coming either, or Duralla. Yeah, I think I like I like the way that Pittsburgh has been playing. Uh, I, we'll we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. I think I still think for this team, it if there was a way we could figure out to trade Uxi and Doug Trio in for just like any other ground, maybe we need the speed for Doug Trio. But I just feel like that's that's gonna that has to become an issue at some point, and I still don't really know what Uxi does. Just as a team thing, because there's not much more we can say about the games than what you said. I think we need to see a, a couple more weeks to really test it out. Because the first week was kind of just like the guy got caught in a trap. And the second week, we kind of had a back and forth game, but he was in control for the most part. And we're not 100% sure about Klon, uh, Klonbrook's team or the all the setup that he's bringing. So I want to see what Pittsburgh does this week, but I have a feeling that that Doug Trio being the ground and Uxi not really having a role, I'm not sure what it does, could eventually push this from a 2-0 and like top four team into a borderline playoff team, just because I'm not sure all of that actually makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a reason he's, you know, six and not top three, despite being 2-0 and with a pretty decent differential. It's because I think the team still is, you know, has some issues. Its recovery options aren't great. Uh, I, I I think this team definitely still has you know some problematic synergy issues, but from a play perspective, I think the scissors so far have been pretty pretty good. Yep, I agree. All right, moving on to the team at number five. Uh, another team, uh, even more so, I'd say that I've been very impressed with the play of is the Muchin Embors, who have for two weeks now come in with a game plan, executed it uh almost flawlessly. What they were trying to do, uh. This week, really great use of Sunny Day on two Mons with two, uh, you know, Sunny Day, Roaring Moon. That's not obvious necessarily, but it, it's pretty clear why it would come. The Sunny Day Skarmory, I think, with, with the speed it had, that's a pretty unique and, you know, worked out really well. Really good set. The the Zangu set also, you know, somewhat unique. Very, very strong. Worked out really, really well. Uh, the, the Sash Mammo, again, all these sets just seem to, they're, they're unique, uh, Sash Mammo obviously isn't like crazy, but it wasn't lead Sash Mammo. So, or it was lead actually, if I remember correctly. He just switched it was. to one. Yeah. It was it's, but, uh, uh, he, 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 it's not like a unique set, but he was Earth Power, which was pretty cool. Uh, it, it's just the, these sets that Muchin brings are both like cool, but also very viable. And it's giving his like play kind of like a really, a really cool, you know, vibe to it at the moment, I think. Uh, he played very well, in my opinion. Uh, did what he had to do. Uh, Keldeo not coming. I, I think Mew didn't even hit the field, if I remember correctly. And, and all the mocks I did, even if you're just like specs, Keldeo just does really, really good that game. It doesn't really have an answer. I don't really see a reason it doesn't come. So, uh, but it, it didn't really matter because he obviously had, it was probably Sunny Day uh, Mew as well, if I had to guess. Maybe that's what he was going for. But, um, uh, obviously, I don't know for sure. I thought the team like was just really good. Out, no matter, even with that, and uh, the game plan was very strong. And, and overall, I don't really think he made too many mistakes in that game that really uh, I could point out right away. Yeah, I I've liked watching both of Moochin's games, and I think like the things I thought were true, like Keldeo and Roaring Moon, who I think are two of the more underrated guys. In draft, I think they're both actually crazy and really hard to deal with. 
Um, the only thing I was like, you went over a lot of the positive points. The only thing I'll say about like you mentioned not bringing Kelly. I think I, I think we mentioned it in the pickums last week. Like you thought this was a really good matchup for him. And after I had looked at it, I had looked at it a little bit, and I said I don't know that this is like that bad of a matchup for him. I think he could have won the game much easier, like with much like sets that didn't require exactly what needed to happen to happen. Just and it it, it still won and it, and it worked. But I'm saying like uh, you mentioned the Keldeo set. I think just like a basic setup Roaring Moon set, I couldn't really stop it at all. So I think sometimes uh, what I could see happening is if you create plans this specific, and then the other team just doesn't bring what you think they're going to bring, you put yourself in a position where you don't have uh, the type of counterplay you need because your sets are so specific. If you under, if you know what I mean, like I considered in this game going just lead Gashadon, set up rocks, and just say, okay, do something with this. And if we had if we had done that, I don't know. Assuming I live trailblaze from the Mamoswine, the whole game is just thrown on its head just from that one thing. Um, so that's the only thing I'll say. I really like the way Moochin's played. Like he definitely he's he's it's exactly what I thought when I saw this team. Like this guy has to be good because he has this team, and it is exactly what I thought that it would be. My only concern with this, because now we're getting near championship contenders, is building things this specific. If you're wrong probably won't work against people who just bring other options in in my opinion from what i've seen i don't know how you feel about that yeah that that could be probably true i think he's kind of if he really wants to contend he's almost forced to do that just because i think the team isn't like up to snuff with um like the composition of the team isn't up to snuff with like top tier contending teams i do think the team's good like i i put it higher than um Oh, some people might have expected, if I remember correctly, from just the post draft, just because I really liked Roaring Moon, Keldeo, Skarmory, Zapdos, those four, which I think those yeah. four have, or I guess Keldeo didn't come this last week, like we said, but um, I I, I do think like he, it's kind of his mo now is that he's bring he's bringing some stuff, he's bringing some not necessarily crazy, but like he, he's gonna try and power predict you in the builder pretty much. Uh, I know he's got a whiteboard, so that's probably what he's doing is he's writing down all his possibilities on the whiteboard, trying to think of what you're going to do. So um, if, if, if with this team, if he really wants to, you know, climb and reach for that championship, I do think he's going to have to come up with some really unique stuff. So uh, we'll just have to see if he can do it. You know what I mean? It's just, It's kind of a wait and see thing at this point. He's knocking on that door of like, tier uh, of, of like true contender tier it, it right now yep all right and with that we're going to move on to number four uh a team that kind of moved down one just by circumstance but i don't think they're necessarily worse or anything is the golden state durants i think <laughs> i'm kind of so they won this last week 2-0 they beat the charleston chestnuts but it was a very close game, right? I, I think we've kind of simmered on their team slightly in terms of this team, you know, has the potential to get overwhelmed and it does lose. Like, it, it's going to be close a lot in a lot of weeks. We haven't seen this team dominate yet. Um, They lose Pokemon, you know, either at the same rate as the opponent or, you know, pretty pretty fast and it, they're going to get in close games and they could get overwhelmed eventually you know by pokemon like cryogonal could eventually overwhelm them if uh you get them in a position to um i i think he played actually pretty good early game he was vaulting around he was he was getting a ton of momentum really early his greninja pressure was really strong he was scarf greninja and he was always playing for that uh end game with greninja very smartly he was weakening what he needed to weaken uh, Dragology was getting weakened. Uh, I, I think, like, <laughs> I don't know what the Thunderous Therian set was, but he kind of stalled his momentum, the turn, where Dr Dragology comes in on the Nasty Plot, and then he doesn't have, like, anything at all, like, Psychic. He has nothing to hit Dragology, so he just has to Thunderbolt. <laughs> um, I, I think if you have nothing to hit Dragology, and, like, uh, I don't know if the Nasty Plot there is even, like, necessarily a great play, 
I, 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 it worked out just because you, you get Dragology low, which is kind of cool because then obviously, like I said, Greninja can become uh, more pressure inducing. So maybe he just thought he could kind of sacrifice uh, Thunderous for that uh, chip to eventually get Greninja into the position that he wanted to get it into. Uh, he brought Scarf Tusk this week, which is what I was prepping with week one. I think Scarf Tusk is a pretty good Mon. Uh, I'm glad he brought it. It worked out well against the Lycanroc Dusk, uh, a Pokemon that could have been potentially threatening. So, uh, you know, he, he had to exchange Revivroom with Bronzong, which um, I don't know if it was necessarily like needed, but it, it ended up being what he did. All, all, the whole game was basically played. I think Latios could have come to this game. I thought Scarf Latios was really strong here. So it not coming, I I, I don't fully uh, understand, but uh, you know I, I I do think all of this was really built up to just lead to the Scarf Greninja Endgame, which makes sense. I think this team, uh, I said it week one and I'll say it now, it really hinges on the Scarfer for the week. I I think Scarfers are really huge for this team to really like uh, get its offensive you know oomph going to really to really get uh, the positioning that it needs with, with the balance that it's really working with. Lanterns come both weeks. I think Lantern's actually more important for what Durant wants to do than people realize. Uh, it's just a, like a momentum-based kind of standard team that's kind of trying to push for an angle where a Scarfer can come in or like some cleanup guy can come in at the end and kind of just take your whittled mods and just chip them all after they've all been chipped down and kind of just clean up at the end. And uh, he, he got that prototypical archetype this week. Yeah, I think I'd like to reiterate what I said earlier that I think Durance was at a disadvantage this week. Like, I genuinely, from remembering the matchup, thought Don probably should have won. So we got to give him credit in the fact, yes, they're a higher ranked team and on paper the team is better. But, like, Bundle should have crushed this team. And he was able to pull out the win probably at a disadvantage structurally. So we have to give him points for that. I think what... We said in the preseason rankings was that this team doesn't have anything just OP. So like you said, I don't know that it's most of the things you said is exactly what I was thinking is unless Durant severely outplays somebody or come like bring some really unexpected set. I think it's always going to be like a 2-0 win or loss for him. Um, and it, because of the speed of the team, almost always it's going to be either Scarf Latios, Greninja, or Tusk. Maybe Rebombi sometimes. Maybe even Thunderous. So uh, there's a lot of like standard Scarf Pokemon on this team. So it, it, that's always something that the other team should be playing around. Is trying to figure out which one's the most logical one to be the Scarf. Yeah, he, should always have a, played... he should always have a Scarfer, and the opponent always has to guess what it is. Yeah, so I think that uh, <laughs> he definitely played well, and I don't want to get caught up in that... Uh, like he was supposed to be Don because on paper, yes, based on record and everything and power ranking. But I think he actually was at the disadvantage this week. So winning from that is definitely points in his favor. I'm still one, one thing I'll say is like, I know every week Rev of Room looks like it has a good matchup and that, you know, it'll always do stuff. I think Rev of Room might be bait and like he would be better off with somebody else, maybe faster or something else in that spot or start bringing the same setup set with parting shot. I think I said this in the sunset video. I just think in these, in these higher divisions, I just don't see rev of room. It threatens things and it's annoying to team build against, but it doesn't usually accomplish what you think it's going to accomplish. So I'm not sure I'd have to look what's out there, but maybe that's the thing that we trade in since we already have a steel, maybe a different poison, maybe with some speed, some more utility to support everything else. Because I'm just I'm not a I'm not a rev room guy though, so I could be biased. But I'd like to see parting shot on this thing with the setup set. I think that could be good. Other than that, I think this is the this is the right place for Durant. Yeah, I I think we're right around where we need to be. I I think if this team's gonna win big, it's probably gonna be like Tusk, like bulk up speed booster Tusk is how they do it. Maybe like if, if the if the week they get their like really big uh differential win. Um. Yeah. I, I I'm I I'm thinking uh. Durant is playing good so far. I've been pretty impressed with their play. Uh, I think the team is still really good. I don't know if it's necessarily the best team in the league anymore, but I, I'm still, like, I don't know if I think that, but I, I still think this is a championship tier contending team. Yeah, definitely. All right.
at number three, we have the Abbotsford Agrons, who I kind of shuffled between Durant's and Agrons, deciding whether to put where to put them at three and four, because I think the top two are pretty clear. Um, I, I decided to put Agrons at three just because he technically he beat the uh, the uh, Durant's, even though um, and, and this game he lost this week, it really wasn't like too crazily his fault uh, uh definitely um i do think like uh this this game obviously was kind of a, a weird one right he lost three pokemon to to, to luck pretty much you know th there's obviously stuff you can do around luck but you know his, his electro got crit turn one his clefable gets defense dropped so it dies to the next razor shell and then his pull obviously misses a draco meteor <clears throat> which leads to a um to a um dead pole from hurricane so th th that's three pokemon lost in some form to luck obviously there's things you can do you can switch electrode out turn one knowing the terrible s fairy doesn't kill because uh earthquake from like an offensive uh garchomp probably does a lot to electrode anyways um the the pull he could have clicked shadow ball or something that was 100 percent accuracy but he was trying to predict a switch to probably quillfish i i think he used heatran pretty good this game he got the magma storm off you know he it, the it was doing a lot of damage i think really the main misplay was around quick Quavel. so he has heatran out on iron hands and he substitutes first uh maybe predicting a swords dance of some kind for some reason and then after he substitutes, he switches to Quaquavel to take a Drain Punch, which he takes. Then he does close combat on the uh, Iron Hands to do, like, no damage. And then he Thunder Punches the Quaquavel and just kills it. So Quaquavel just dies. Um, I, I And then he goes Heatran again and just dies to Drain Punch after he Earth Powers anyways. I think... If he just like subs with Heatran and then subs again, and so he's at lowest HP possible, <coughs> and then he goes for um Earth Power, and then he goes out to uh what's it called after Clefable to finish it, like he does in the end game of the game, but Quick Quavel's still alive. And then uh he's forced to go um Samra Hisui Clefkeys like he did in the previous game. Or Spectre, which I think Spectre versus Clefable. You don't necessarily lose that if you're the unaware Clefable. And if you're against Samura, obviously, if you don't get a defense drop, you kill it. I I, I, I think um, there was actually a, a way for Abbotsford to win this game in the end if he doesn't sack Quaquable. I, I think uh, if he kind of angled the um, Heatran so that it got the necessary chip on... Iron Hands, so that Moonblast kills from Clefable, and it was Clefable and Quiquevel, both full HP, versus Samurai Hisui Spectre, both full, at full HP. I think the game is actually um, winnable, especially if Quiquevel can get, like, an Aqua Step off, it's plus one speed, and if it outspeeds Spectre, I'm pretty sure it wins that end game. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on uh, the uh, what I think was the key of the game. At least, obviously, there was a ton of packs there was a ton of luck involved, but the, the, the key of the game from Agons that was in his control, the quick quabble sack. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I thought at the end of the game. So first of all, the fact it was as close as it was, even regardless of any of the plays he could have done differently in the end game was a testament to um, how he recovered from what happened. Because like you said, there was, scenarios i remember thinking when i was watching like he can definitely still win this depending on the coquable set like oh, and the clefable set like with certain sets i think he still wins this if the if the clefable doesn't take enough chip i think it'll beat the spectre so i agree that um the drain punch is what kept him in the game because i think if he didn't get a lot of health back from the heatran he could have done enough damage on the hands to where he could have beaten it with the Clefable. The exact line you said was what I was thinking of. Uh, I don't know that the Coquable set was offensive enough to actually outlast in the endgame because I think it was a like pretty much fully stop Hasui and Samurott set. I don't know that it had any offensive uh, investment at all. Well, 
really needs is Aqua Staff, I think, to outspeed Spectre. Yeah. I, I, I feel um, like if if you sub twice with Heatran to get down to like five uh, percent or whatever Earth Power to do seventy like he did to Iron Hands, go Clefable right. I know we're just going play by play now. Go Clefable, Boom Blast the Iron Hands, kill it, and then he has to choose between Spectre or uh, Samurai. I believe in the game he chose Samurai right, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. He he uses Razor Shout. <laughs> if he doesn't get a defense drop, um then you kill it, obviously, but if I'm Agron's, I might even... Quick Quibble's your answer to his Sweet and Samurai, right? And it's still alive. I might even go hard Quick Quibble, you know what I mean? On yeah. uh, the Hisui and Samurai. And then I might click Aqua Step that first turn, because if he goes Spectre on close combat, that's obviously bad. But uh, if you Aqua Step the Hisui and Samurai, all he does is just hit you with a not very effective move. Unless, obviously, he's Air Slash. He could have been Air Slash. I don't know if he was Air Slash or not. Um, I don't think he was. No. <laughs> So you click Aqua Step if you have it. If he goes Spectre, he gets two code. If he stays in, you get the plus one speed you need, and then you just click Close Combat the next turn, and I think you're in a pretty uh, great position because your Clefable's still at 100%. Uh, I think it was winnable. The fact that, yeah, the fact that there was a, any line at all at the end shows, one, the the well-roundedness of the Agron's team and also the downfall of you know Hyper Offense in that even when everything went right, so I played a lot of mocks of this game, and essentially, the game was if you hit Hurricane, you win. And if you miss, you lose. The fact he hit three with the crit, like, you went through all the things. And it was still close. It was close at the end, even with, if that was a misplay, like, let's say that it was. It was still relatively close. Like, without a defense drop, which did happen, which isn't weird, right, because it's 50%. I still think it would have ended up just a 1-0 against Spectrier. Like, it's not, it, it wouldn't have been much worse than that. So, um... Yeah, I think that the thing you can ask is I don't remember if he had something to switch in on Garchomp, but if he knew that wasn't going to kill, he probably should have just switched it out because I think the Electrode was good in the game. Um, other than that, I don't know what... And like you said, he probably should have just Shadow Balled just to make sure that you got damage and a kill because he wasn't Specs or anything, so he could have always just yeah, turned out. He, 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 he was he was predicting the uh, Quilfish Isui, which is like... <laughs> It's fine in theory, I guess, but it, it, obviously, I mean, as we saw, the downside is way more than the the, the risk. Probably not worth the reward there. Yeah, and because of the set, because it wasn't Eevee like Quillfish, it was Scarf. They said so. If the Draco, if he had been Draco, probably would have killed him. But if it was the normal Eevee light set, I don't know that it was better because it was probably Spadef Eevee like Quillfish. It wouldn't have taken that much damage, and you would have had a U turn out anyway. So I think in retrospect, those are the couple of plays that literally happened that we could say um, probably not optimal, and you did open yourself up to get – yeah, it's like a 2% chance for the crit, right? But you did open yourself up to this yeah, um, yeah. So, possibility. Obviously, aggron has got like, unlucky in this game. I, I just think like – yeah. Mainly, the quick level was sacked for literally no – like usually sacks get you like a free switch in or something. He just went heat train again right after – so the quick quibble was sacked yeah. for quite literally no gain. Um, like, like all it was was you lose quick I I think that was like the only play in his control that really like had anything to contribute to like, uh, significantly contribute to him losing the game. Like that was the only play that I really was scratching my head at completely. Everything else, like I knew what he was going for. Yeah, I agree. All right. So moving on to the team at number two, we have. The Luscious Low Punnies. All right, so this past week, the Luscious Low Punnies beat the Philadelphia Flygons 5-0 with some pretty cool ideas, some pretty cool ideas. This uh, sub-Araquanid was very cool. It basically uh, made uh, the opponent exchange Pokemon uh, to break the sub. It did it at the beginning of the game with Halucha and at the end of games with the survivors of the Hydreigon Onslaught. So... Uh, she uh really used that mon to a great effect. The screen's golden go. Obviously, the opponent kind of just let her do it, but it was used to obviously very devastating effects. And uh, you know, the nasty plot hydragon really, really popped off. Did exactly what it needed to do. Uh, Mary, I think, is kind of a in her bag, so to speak, so far this season. She's kind of going crazy. She's coming in each week with a game plan, and she's executing it. Uh, so far, at least, basically to perfection. I think the team's strong. I think her uh, sets are strong. I think uh, the game plan's strong so far. 
Uh, she has the best differential in the league right now. Uh, she preserved differential this game by keeping Hydreigon around and going her Araquanid. She she's doing everything right. You know er everything you can do to help you in these games. She's kind of hitting all the boxes. She's on full throttle at the moment. Uh, I I don't think she, necessarily anything uh, went awry this game. The beginning of the game, you know, the toxic spikes go up. She didn't have removal. Uh, it 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 looked maybe like it could have been a little scary, but she pretty much you know calmly guided it right back into her uh right back into her well, wheelhouse and the, the second the golden go was out on that sloking and the sloking kind of just let it go uh the sloking kind of just let the golden go do its thing for three turns uh, like i said when you let your opponent do what they want to do for three turns with basically no response you're going to put yourself in a bad position mary took full advantage and uh i i think she's kind of rocking out now just doing exactly what she wants to do each week yeah, I like the Low Punnies team a lot. Um, part who did Low Punnies play week one? I don't remember. Uh, Dracos. I but part I think we should point out Low Punnies is kind of farming right now, a little bit. I feel like um, she hasn't played one of the teams we have ranked very high, and e even counting the week three game, which has happened, but we won't go into it yet. Um, so I just to point that out just for full transparency, but I like this team. I think I would use this team if I was going to pick any other team to use. I would pick this one. So I'm a fan of using it. I played some mocks with it. I still wish it was Terra Araquanid because like that same set with Terra Water in that game would have might have killed like four four things. Um, but I get it why it's Diancie because that is really good. And we'll probably see at least one Diancie sweep, if not two this season. Uh, the only criticism I'll have of this team, and it hasn't come up yet, is we mentioned th the speed issue on this team will be an issue at some point. It has to be, right? So top speed is what, 104? 115 like it's really with Raikou. Slow. Oh, yeah. Okay, Raikou, Raikou, right. But for all the main threats, right? Like, yeah. I, I think it's going to be an issue at some point. That's my only real criticism of it, because we've yet to see it even really be challenged at all. And I do think it's really good. And like I said, I would use it. So that's my only thing is when they play one of the other like top five ish teams and they have a distinct speed disadvantage. And if that team predicts the score for right, um, it's going to which again, counting this week, it hasn't happened yet. But we're going to uh, see once she plays the top contenders, if that speed issue keeps this from being a championship team, because other than that, I really like everything that's going on. I don't really have any game criticism at all. Yeah, I, I I'd say right now Mary is kind of in uh not necessarily cruise she could control. Be number one. Yeah. yeah, she could be number one. I I, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say cruise control, but she's chilling right now. You know, she's feeling good. All right. And up next, the team at number one, we have the Frederick Clefkeys. So last week the Frederick Clefkeys beat the uh Abbotsford Agrons. Obviously with a, a little bit of help from uh, some luck but i don't really want to take away from the fact that i think club keys is playing really good right now i think they you know they're getting momentum early in these games getting kills early they have a clear game plan they had the sash garchomp expecting the electrode lead wanted to get down to one percent whether it was and then kill it back uh potentially uh i don't know if the earthquake 100 percent killed it really it probably depends on you know garchomp investment and electrode investment um the Bravery Hisui was really cool. It popped off, obviously, with some help from hits and also a miss of a Draco Meteor. Um, <coughs> Iron Hands really forced exchanges. You know, it, it basically came out and something had to die uh, on the opponent team. I think even without luck, that would have been true. Iron Hands comes out and he kind of has to choose something to uh, forcibly get removed from the game in, ex in an exchange. That's really what Iron Hands uh, excels at. Spectre didn't even really have to come out this game. Um, it never hit the field when your most valuable mon doesn't hit the field. Uh, it, it, it's a good feeling. So, you know, uh, I, I think, like, there was nothing that Klefki's really did wrong in this game at all. Uh, I, I think, like, maybe uh, uh, sacking Quilfish Hisui, it, it probably was a sack. It was probably technically the right play even there. Um, <coughs> uh, I, I think he's kind of playing... Pretty much as good as you can play. Uh, I, I think the team's good. I don't I, even though he's ranked number one. I don't know if it's the best team in the league, but I, I just think you know he's not making necessarily any huge mistakes. And I think this team has huge upside when it is played well. 
and that's why I have him at number one because I think uh, he is playing well. So the upside on this team, you know, the, the really strong guys really excel in a in a well uh, driven car, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's difficult not like. I think you could have low punnies one because I think it's probably a bit more of a consistent team minus the speed issue, but you know, orange is two and oh, and he beat the one ranked team from last week. So it's tough not to put him here. Obviously it was kind of a baloney game in general. Um, I think the, the scarf quillfish, which is the, what the set was, was kind of weird. Um, I, it's clearly that it was supposed to do something, but I think that in a fully fleshed out game might have been a detriment. Yeah, I mean, my uh, guess think, is outspeeding Kill Dragapult is my guess. Yeah, I, it's probably, yeah, it's what it's supposed to do, but I, it, maybe it would have worked. But I'm just saying in a, in a longer game, that might have become an issue because then there's not really a Dragapult check if that doesn't work. So um, that's the only criticism I could really give him. Like we've seen he's 2-0, and probably like what, plus seven something plus, with... plus six i believe i think he won four okay, uh, plus, plus uh, six without it might be seven he won five oh he won five oh so plus seven yeah. okay so he's plus seven with literally not using who in my opinion is the best guy in the format so it's tough not to put him at one um we've seen the power of iron hands which is i i don't know that anybody's even ever had this thing and since i've been in pbo if they have it hasn't been on an important team that i remember um, it's a crazy two for one. Like if it's played well, it's always a two for one. And that on a team with spikes and Spectre in the back, who even though it hasn't come into the games, warps the whole prep of the game around it. So uh, just it's it's like Steph Curry, just him being there makes other people better. So that's the impact of having one of those top three picks in that there's so much prep time spent on Spectre that then we just lose to Braviary Hasui. Um. So yeah, I like the way Orange is playing. I like that he played fast. He played. I, I'm, I, I did a bit of a criticism on the Quillfish, but I said in the Pickums, I said I hope he doesn't bring defense when you're a hyper offense team, and he didn't. He brought gas, and he. Oh, this is supposed to be Orange's year. He has the team support for, in my opinion, the best guy in the format, and he should win virtually every week. It's probably going to be in his favor somewhat because there's only so many checks to Spectre, right? Like it, every dark type is not a check to Spectre. You need like really specific things to be able to stop this guy. So if he plays well, he should be the number one team. So I'm I'm happy with this play so far. And uh, we've yet to see any of the issues that might occur with the defensive backbone of the team, which I, I think at some point we're going to see it. Like it could have mm -hmm. happened this week if it had been a longer game. And at some point, the fact that most of our defensive pieces like Tink, Fortress, Quillfish can't recover any health and can only come in so many times. One of them needs to be Eevee Alight. Yeah, uh, I mean, that will, will be an issue at some point, but um, it hasn't been yet. Uh, so. uh, obviously, there's something to be said about this game being a 2-0 with how much luck he got, but like that kind of just shows how sometimes the Pokemon just have to die because it's so, like frail at times but i i don't think that's necessarily when you're playing hyper offense and you're still winning i don't necessarily know if that's a, a chink in the armor you know what i mean i don't i don't know if that's like yeah. actually a, a real downfall uh it, it's it's um I, I think he's like not played bad at all to really warrant any uh worries at the moment uh i i, I think he's in a pretty commanding position with this team definitely yeah and this is the week we'll so, uh, you know, unless Bravier Hirsui hits five more Hurricanes, this week we'll find out because he's playing the most balanced team. So, we'll hyper offense, we'll see if it can out offense longevity. All right. And with that, we are done with the power rankings post week two. Thank you for watching. This has been the Alabama Elikazams and the New York Malamars. Peace out.